Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So, for the last week, uh, people said that uh, they would mostly like to see signatures and uh, maybe zero knowledge proofs and also uh, attacks on the uh, discrete log, the generic attacks on discrete log, and, and not so much RSA, uh, which I agree with. So you can uh, re read up on RSA crypto system uh, separately and just see it as an exa another example. Although, of course, there's interesting issues there uh, too. Um, so, uh, uh, ne nevertheless, I wanted to start with um, uh, finalizing something about encryption. Um, okay, which which I think that you you still um, um, it was not on my um, options, but uh, I think this this needs to be this needs to be said. So um, the encryption, uh, so the so-called textbook. Uh, El Gamal uh, encryption, uh, which comes from a uh, textbook um, Diffie Hellman uh, key exchange, uh, right? Uh, uh, that that we talked about last time. So uh, the um, the public the secret key. So parameters uh, is uh, some. Uh, um, okay. Um, basically, uh, a multiplicative group uh, group uh, G uh, with generator um, a little G, uh, and uh, the group is of order uh, Q. Okay, and uh, examples for this is that uh, G is the group of uh, ZP star, so it's group mm, like this, uh, where uh, P is prime. So, in other words, residues in um, um, uh, modulo P, except of zero. And because uh, P is a prime, so all these residues are co-prime with P. And uh, G is um, uh, some element in, the, in this group. The order of this uh, of this group generated by G is uh, P minus one. Uh, so therefore, uh, not a prime. So that's one example. Uh, but this is not a great example because P is uh, very large and uh, the modulus here would be very large, uh, therefore, because look at how uh, El Gamal key generation goes. The secret key is a random exponent in uh, ZQ and the public key is set to the generator to the exponent, uh, the secret key. The encryption uh, under the public key of a message, and uh, because it's a textbook El Gamal, the message space is the group. Okay, and uh, the way you encrypt is uh, the encryption is a pair um, C1, C2 uh, such that C1 is G to the R for R randomly taken from the same group, from uh, from the same space of exponents, which is the order of this of this group. And C2 is Y is uh, so uh, this is denoted X, and this is denoted Y in the you know the, the, the public secret key is little exponent X, and public key is Y, which is G to the X, uh, is Y to the R times M. So in other words, uh, the ciphertext is this pair C2, C1, C2, which is G to the R, Y to the R times M. To decrypt using the secret key, uh, where uh, Y is the public key. 
um, uh, to decrypt a cipher text, C1, C2, uh, I do um, output M equal uh, C2 uh, multiplied by C1 to the minus uh, X. Okay, where X is the secret key. So why does this work? Okay, it's the same math as in Diffie-Hellman because uh, indeed it came from a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So C2 is YR uh, times M, that's C2. C1 is G to the R, uh, and I take it to the minus X, right? But that is Y is uh, G to the X. So this is G to the X, uh, uh, G to the X to the R times M times G to the R to minus X, uh, which is G to the X R times M times G to the minus Rx and these two cancel and you get M, right? So we showed this because this is basically a Diffie Hellman a key agreement cast as an encryption, uh, but uh, the plain text here is in the has to be encoded as a group element, All right? And um, if uh, P is say a two thousand bit prime, then Q is a two thousand bit uh, modulus. So therefore, little x and little r are 2000 bit integers. So the uh, exponentiation that happens during the key generation is an expansion with 2000 bit value. And uh, what's worse, because that only happens one as initialization, but here when you decrypt, when you encrypt, you're taking two uh, very large exponentiations, right, with long exponents. And uh, when you decrypt, this is again long exponents. Uh, you can uh, take a different example, the same uh, group. So G is, is a, a subgroup uh, within this space. So in other words, it's all uh, elements that have this form, um, uh, where um, Q, is a prime, is a large uh, prime uh, factor of uh, P minus one. Um, and uh, G to the Q is one uh, modulo P. Okay, which uh, in fact is guaranteed if uh, Q no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. So G has to be a special uh, value, uh, which, and it's not unique. Um, if you know the factorization of P minus one, so you generate your keys, then you can choose it so that P minus one is divided itself by a, a large prime factor, and you can create a generator uh, of this uh, subgroup. So, um, Okay, so um, the key thing is that um, uh, that Q can be uh, can be relatively short, uh, even if uh, P is much larger. Okay, so we'll see attacks in a second on discrete log generic attacks. And uh, the general number field uh, seed uh, is an attack that works on, that depends on the modulus P. And um, we'll see a generic attacks that, this, that um, depend on not this modulus, but the size of the, of the multiplicative subgroups that you're work, working with. And um, that subgroup basically has to be the size of twice the security parameter. So if the security parameter is 80, this can have 160. And now why? Because this means that now secret key and randomness are 160-bit integers. 
instead of 2000. So they are eight times shorter, which means that encryption is eight times faster and decryption is eight times faster. So that's a you know, uh, important consideration. Um, a very different setting is uh, G is an uh, elliptic curve. Um, uh, of order uh, prime uh, Q, uh, for example, uh, Q, the length of Q is uh, uh, 150 to 256, uh, and there are standardized curves uh, for uh, that show examples of primes and uh, that, that hit this, uh, that you know, the curve forms a group of this size. Again, uh, these are twice the security parameter. Um, hold on. Okay. These are twice the security parameter. Um, and, um, oh, hold on. Hold on. What? The uh, what on earth happened? Uh, no, sorry about that. Uh, document stop share. Okay, so okay. Uh, to understand uh, why the security parameter has to be like this, why the sizes of these groups have to be like this, it's the same generic attack that would justify uh, in this setting. Okay. So we'll see this uh, in a in a second, but there are still uh, two uh, problems with this with this with this encryption. Um, well, okay, what is the security based on? Um, so uh, textbook uh, textbook El Gamal is. Uh, indistinguishable, which is the same as CPA security for the case of public key encryption, um, under a decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, so decisional uh, Diffie-Hellman assumption um, in uh, group G. Okay. Uh, Roughly, so this is the same argument for uh, DVM and T exchange. Roughly, why is that? So look, what does the attacker have? He has G to the X, that's a public key. Then he has G to the R. And the ciphertext, and the, so that's uh, this part of the ciphertext. And this one is G to the XR times the message. Now, by decisional D. Hellman, you know that the pair G to the X, G to the R, and G to the XR can be replaced with G to the X, G to the R, and G to the Z for an uh, independent Z. So that's the first thing you do. And now you notice that this is a one-time pad in the group. So this multiplication is a group one-time pad. So whether this message encrypted here is M0 or M1 from adversary's challenge, Multiplying it by an independent group element uh, means complete randomization of this M. Uh, so that's the end of the proof. Okay. Um, so this is also great. I mean, it's great, but uh, two things. First of all, we have to assume decisional assumption on the group. And uh, last time, uh, if you check my slides, then you will see that, well, and I was saying this in the lecture, that in elliptic curves, sometimes we have a trapdoor that by linear map, that actually breaks the Diffie-Hellman assumption. Okay? And in any event, it's a stronger assumption than computational Diffie-Hellman or discrete logarithm. We would prefer security to be based on these computational assumptions instead of a decisional one. And another problem is that it's only CPA secure. Okay, uh, let's look at these one by one. So three, oh, okay. So the message space is inconvenient. I have to encode into a group. 
uh, is inconvenient in this setting because now I have to, my group elements have to look like this. Um, okay, so how do I encode an arbitrary bit string into something like this? I have to have some way of encoding it onto this group. Likewise, with an elliptic curve, I have to have a way to encode and a way to decode uh, from it. It would be better if these were natively simply bit strings and not group elements. Um, so, uh, um, let's look at the CPA thing first. Um, we, so uh, stronger uh, notion of uh, public key uh, encryption security uh, is uh, CCA. Right. What does that look like? Um, there is a key generation that uh, creates a secret and a public key. Adversary gets a public key. Um, and then this is just like in a uh, uh, chosen plane attack, right? But in addition, adversary can query, send any ciphertext into a decryption oracle that has the secret key and will decrypt, right? So it will send M, which is a decryption uh, under the secret key of the ciphertext. Um, and so adversary specifies two messages in the message space and uh, you get back C, which is an encryption under the public key of one of these two messages where the bit uh, is chosen at the very beginning. It's E00 zero zero or one. Okay, so uh, this guy and uh, this can uh, re recurse, right? So uh, he can ask any number of these queries. And with the only thing constraint is that if you call the challenge ciphertext C star, then uh, what he's asking here to decrypt must not equal the challenge ciphertext, right? Because otherwise the game is cannot be won if he gets the challenge ciphertext and he can just simply ask the decryption oracle to decrypt it, he gets MB here and therefore uh, decides immediately what's B. Okay, so he decides this bit B prime and we say in the usual fashion that uh, PKE is um, CC secure, um, is for all efficient uh, algorithms A, and the probability uh, that B prime is B is uh, at most, uh, well, one half, because this is the, the trivial one, plus negligible uh, amount. So some negligible function of the security parameter. Well, the, the usual way was, we said, if this bit is one, given that bit is zero, if this bit is one, even this bit is one, but you can just uh, make it like this, it's shorter. Um, okay, um, so that's what we would like, right? Like we saw this for symmetric encryption, um, all the issues with mm, not being secure against this, uh, and uh, the benefits of being secure like this, right? Uh, which in particular created secure channels uh, and authenticated, in, uh, you know, right? And um, um, authenticated encryption. So um, we would like the same, uh, the same issues would, 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 would play uh, public encryption security. And we would like to stop it uh, also in that case. So note uh, that uh, textbook Al Gamal um, is not uh, CCA secure. Oops. Um. Um. Um, I think if I 
work with the pen too. Okay, maybe. Okay. Um, it's not CCA secure. And uh, why is that? Um, uh, because it's 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 malleable. Okay, so the same issue that prevented CCA security for symmetric encryption. Um, given how is it malleable? Given the public key, uh, which is Y, which is G to the X, uh, and ciphertext uh, C, which was um, C1, C2, which was G to the R, Y to the R uh, times M. Um, um, anyone can uh, create um, this uh, ciphertext uh, prime, uh, which is, um, uh, let's say, D1, D2, uh, such that, uh, so this is a ciphertext, which is an encryption under the public key Y of message M. Uh, such that this uh, encryption is an encryption of um, such that C prime is an encryption under the same key of message M prime, um, such that M prime is M times uh, delta, uh, and this operation is group in group G. Okay, whatever this group was, like an elliptic curve or or the um, or a residue group of uh, of uh, prime residues. Um, how is that? Uh, very simple. Uh, let's say D one is simply equals C one, and D two is uh, C two times delta. And again, this is in a group uh, G operation, right? So um, it's sort of immediate, right? Like that this new ciphertext is of the form G to the R, Y to the R times M times delta. Uh, but you can uh, hide your uh, tracks. So this part of the ciphertext is the same, right? But you can actually randomize an Elgamal ciphertext. For example, like this, D1 is D1 times uh, G to the, um, uh, let's say, uh, alpha, and D2 is C2 times Y to the alpha times uh, delta for um, random alpha in the uh, order of the group. Then what is this? This, um, this became uh, G to the R times G to the alpha, which is G to the R plus alpha mod Q. And uh, this was, um, C2 was G to the R times M. And now, uh, sorry, Y, Y to, to the R mod M. And this is Y to the alpha times delta. Um, so, um, so this is y to the r plus alpha mod q uh, times uh, m to the delta. And um, now not only you have generated a related, uh, an encryption of a related message related in this way, but you have generated a fresh encryption where the randomness used in this new encryption is uh, is random, right? I mean, randomness is random. It's independent of, hold on a second. Um, this value is independent of R, right? Because if alpha is random mod Q, then this is a one-time pad, right? So R plus alpha is independent of R. Okay, uh, so so in other words, this ciphertext is independent of this one, except uh, it has is an encryption of a related message. 
note uh, if delta is one, uh, then m prime is just m, uh, right? Obviously. So what you'd happen here in that case is that d1, d2 is the fresh encryption of the same m. Uh, this is uh, something called re -rand randomizable encryption. You have a ciphertext that is an encryption of M, and you create a new encryption of, well, if you run this code with delta equal one, the same M, but it's a random, it's a new independent random encryption. And the way you did it, you take the previous ciphertext and you multiply it to G to alpha, and this part of ciphertext multiply it to Y to the alpha. So this could have useful properties. Like for example, if uh, you're getting uh, an encryption in a Tor network, you're getting a ciphertext and you want to route it uh, in a way that people who monitor the network cannot tell whether you re-encrypted the same message or you have sent a new message. Well, Elgama has this property. You can take ciphertext and you can randomize them using this procedure with delta equal one. And what comes out is an encryption of the same message. So you didn't, you, you transmit it, but you transmit it in a way that people looking at your inputs and you're looking at your outputs cannot correlate the two. Yes. So this probability can uh, be of great benefit in some application. Uh, but in this case, it basically shows that it's not, it's malleable and therefore it's not CC secure, right? Because it's the same attack as always. If your challenge is C star, then C here can be just a randomization of C star. So you take C star and you randomize in this way. So uh, the C that you create here is like D1, D2. And C star here is the C1, C2. So you took this C star, you randomized it. Therefore, you satisfy this constraint. It's a different ciphertext. Therefore, you will get it decrypted. And what you get decrypted is not just a message related to M. It's actually M itself, right? It's simply the MB that you're getting back straight away. Okay. Um, so how do we fix um, the, the CCA insecurity of El Gamal. Okay, so uh, this um, it's uh, there's two basic paradigms for that you know are known for doing this. Um, so how do you get from CPA uh, public key encryption to uh, to CC it, public key encryption. Okay. Uh, how do we get from CPA secure uh, symmetric encryption to CCA symmetric? Well, essentially we use part of the key to Mac. Okay, that was like our compilers. And um, could we do anything like this here in the context of public key encryption? Well, not really because uh, you need, you have this public key to encrypt. So what do you, what do you mark with, with the public key? Well, what kind of security would that give you? Um, it's a public value. Everybody has it. So everybody can create these quote unquote marks. Um, you know, how do we even start using the public key as an input to a mark? And it basically does not make sense. Uh, I mean, first of all, because it's a public value, right? So you cannot serve as a, as a MAC key. Um, so here's one uh, you know, uh, way to compile. It was given by Fuji uh, Saki and Okamoto. Um, and they said this, um, Encrypt, um, so make the ciphertext. Um, um, so if uh, enc uh, dec 
and key generation uh, is a CPA secure uh, public key encryption. Uh, then the following are uh, the same key generation and a modified um, encryption and decryption algorithms are uh, CCA uh, secure public key encryption. And so the key generation is the same, right? So you have the same secret key and public key pair. So how do you encrypt? Uh, encryption prime, given a public key and a message, um, we do this. Pick a random key uh, from, uh, for like, uh, um, for symmetric encryption. Um, and then um, um, let R be uh, chosen as uh, it's a randomness, uh, randomness space uh, of uh, uh, and of the underlying encryption. For an encryption to be CPA secure, it has to be randomized. So this encryption has some um, has some inherent randomness, right? So um, where was the randomness of uh, Ergamal uh, here, right? This is the encryption randomness. It takes a random R and creates a G to the R, Y to the R pair and uses it to encrypt M, right? Uh, so so this is my, my randomness. Um, uh, encryption randomness here, and it outputs uh, the modified cipher text as um, um, C and um, and E, uh, where. where C is an encryption, uh, the underlying encryption on the uh, public key of um, of key K. Uh -huh, okay, and I have to do um, E prime here. And uh, sorry, uh, uh, key, uh, so I encrypt key K using randomness R. Um, e prime is um, hash of the key uh, XORT with the randomness. So here, um, uh, assume for simplicity uh, that it's, um, that the space of randomness is uh, n bit strings. Okay, it could be not, it, it was ZQ in the other case, but you know, just take large enough so that it can be, um, a random choice here can be, um, uh, you know, can encode um, at the randomness that you actually use in this algorithm. I mean, without loss of generality, randomness is always bits, right? But how did you exactly to use these bits to generate a random number in ZQ? Well, that's a sampling algorithm. But uh, randomness is, um, you know, the convenient form for an algorithm is, is binary. And here, um, uh, H uh, hashes uh, onto uh, the same space um, like this, so I can have an XOR. And uh, E is just um, um, a symmetric uh, key encryption 
um, using key K and uh, message M. And that's it. Okay. Um, there is, um, it, so this is still a sketch of Uchisaki Okamoto. Uh, it is, um, uh, I should have, well, the story with Fujisaki Okamoto was uh, a little bit that the first compiler had some technical issues and it was uh, amended. Uh, so, uh, and this encryption has to be CCA secure, uh, symmetric key encryption. So, um, uh, okay, so this is the standard move of do, doing what we call the hybrid encryption. So uh, your public key encryption, underlying public key encryption uh, uh, allows you to encrypt limited uh, messages of limited size and you use symmetric encryption to encrypt messages of long size. So that's that's not an extra cost. That's what you do and would you would do anyway. Um, the issue here is that uh, in addition, this will give us CC security. Um, um, but uh, possibly uh, need to include uh, C and E prime as associated um, authenticated data. So if you uh, remember the, uh, uh, the CCA secure and crypto, so, um, you can, um, yeah, you can, if you think of this uh, encryption as both authenticating and encrypting, uh, you might want to put in those two into the authenticated part. Okay, uh, how do you decrypt? Um, you take uh, this um, T E prime E um, tuple, and you first of all you run the underlying decryption um, under the secret key on the cipher text, and you generate. Uh, some plain text. Uh, what is the plain text? A key. Uh, then you compute the randomness as uh, hash the key um, x or uh, e prime. Then you verify that c is an output of an encryption under the corresponding public key of this uh, plain text using this randomness. So you verify that the encryption was, correct, cor was created correctly given this randomness. And if so, uh, then output, um, which is the SKE decryption uh, uh, using this key and, and this last part of the ciphertext, okay? And uh, if not, uh, reject. So output a rejection. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a secure, secure, uh, CCA secure in a random Oracle model uh, for this function, uh, hash function H. And assuming that this is a uh, CCA secure and uh, symmetric key encryption, but that uh, we don't add. Um, what is the uh, intuition for uh, why, you know, why should this work? So um, let's uh, skip this, this, this secret key encryption, symmetric key encryption. And just focus on uh, how can anybody get this key K out of this ciphertext? So uh, the uh, by CPA security of this encryption, uh, key K is protected. 
but perhaps it's uh, malleable, right? So somebody can create a related uh, cipher text that uh, you know includes some uh, key that is related to this one or even that one by itself. Um, but then they would have to create this uh, hash of the same value, extort a modified randomness, right? The randomness that is going to uh, to verify here. And um, if H is a random oracle, then the only way to create this value is to actually compute this hash. If you don't compute this hash, hash this is a one-time uh, pad. Um, so, um, if you um, So uh, now, if you and if you do create this value like this, uh, then it is um, then a, if if a decryption oracle during the CCA attack, okay, decrypted successfully. Then that means that this cybertext that you brought here satisfies uh, the following. Let's keep it prime, but C was an encryption of some key using certain randomness, and E encrypted that randomness under the hash of the key. Then decryption oracle can be simulated without the knowledge of the secret key. It would monitor the hash function. Which is a random oracle, so therefore adversary, uh, you know, uh, there is adversary uh, queries the hash function um, uh, in addition to this whole game. And for every hash query, it would uh, see, okay, let's take this cipher text and, um, re, you know, and XOR it by the hash of the key of this query. That's a certain randomness. Let's verify in a forward direction, knowing just the public key and this key from the query, whether uh, uh, C is a proper encryption under this public key of this query key using the randomness that satisfies this, right? So the randomness is simply, if this is uh, uh, C and E prime, okay, and I'm ignoring uh, this part, then um, I will look at the randomness, which is an XOR between E prime and hash of K. And if this goes forward, then uh, this oracle replies with the key K. Or um, because it's a symmetric key stuff, I will actually uh, use, I would not reply to key K, I will use key K to decrypt uh, this part of the cipher, right? But uh, just skip that part and think of outputting the key kind. Um, so, in other words, the decryption oracle can be emulated without knowing the secret key. And that means that the whole game reduces to CPA security of the underlying encryption. Um, there is uh, these are a few more things you have to do. So, like, why why does this type of encryption, why this emulation would correspond to what a real decryption does? Because the real decryption, just like the emulation, checks this forward. So it has this, uh, you know, it basically checks the same constraints that the randomness uh, derived in this way. When you use it and the key forward direction, you get this cipher. Uh, that was sent. Okay, so it can be emulated without the secret key. Now, why uh, adding this encryption of the randomness does not endanger the CPA security of the encryption? Because in the random oracle model for hash, to learn anything about R, you can only by querying the hash function on the key K. And that is a decision problem. I'm I'm, I'm giving you this encryption, and 
for a key case that was a random. Uh, and you took this type of text and somehow managed to query the hash function on the plain text. Uh, that breaks the one-way security of this encryption, uh, which is which is, is, fo is follows from CPE security. Okay, this is if you think of Elgamal, uh, this is simply as if you're taking an Elgamal on a random message. And someone given the cipher that so has computed this message. Well, that's clearly stronger than distinguishing between encryption of M0 and encryption of M1. I I actually recovered the whole plain text uh, from the cipher text. Hold on, I have to uh, close. Um, so it's it's not a full uh, proof. It's um, the scheme. Um, it's you know don't don't quote me as that this is exactly the Fujisaki or Kondomoto that is provable. You might uh, need uh, all sorts of uh, small fixes to this for this proof to go through. Um, but it's a generic way that, you know, unfortunately it assumes this random oracle uh, strong model for the hash function. Um, so that's one um, um, one uh, struck against it. Um, it would not change if the message space of the encryption was a group. I will just pick a key at random from the group and encrypt that. And nothing would change here because I don't have to, I just take a group element and hash it. Uh, so that's fine. Um, that's very convenient for uh, Elgamal encryption case. Um, uh, the problem um, is, is the first uh, using um, RO, a random oracle um, model. Uh, for a hash. Okay. Uh, the thing with this, though, is that um, almost everything that we uh, you, you use in practice does assume this. Uh, we have crypto systems that avoid this assumption, but they tend to be more expensive. And in practice, um, designs which are less expensive and has an uh, argument assuming this idealized um, view of a hash function basically are preferred, okay? Just because, okay, so they, you know, if somebody could create a DAX which ba based on the fact that this hash function is not random, they would violate, but it's just, uh, um, well, people don't believe that uh, such attacks are, are feasible, although there are some attacks on schemes which work in the random oracle, but if you instantiate this with anything uh, like any other, any known function, the attack, comp the scheme is insecure. But such schemes, this was shown for artificial schemes. Okay, so you have to create a scheme so that for that, so that would be true. Uh, and uh, simply speaking, you know, people don't want to pay the cost of these uh, uh, that schemes which avoid uh, this assumption uh, so far uh, tend to come with. Okay, uh, that might change uh, in in the future, but that's uh, um, that's where we are now. Uh, and uh, the second problem is that uh, decryption. Uh, requires re-encryption. And if you look at the cost of Elgamal, uh, this is uh, in Elgamal, dec decryption is one exponentiation, encryption is two exponentiations. So, uh, so therefore, 
your modified decryption would have three exponentiations. So you actually made it three times more expensive, right? The encryption is the standard stuff. You just encrypt a key, you hash the key and XOR with the randomness, so that's fast, and you do symmetric encryption for the payload, uh, nothing special, right? So this is, you didn't really change the costs. Maybe um, you have to have a little more bandwidth now, because that's the non-standard uh, part. Um, but if you really wanted to do it, probably you can fold this cost somehow into this, into this, um, into the symmetric encryption. The problem is uh, this part, and um, so basically, it's uh, I don't think it's used in practice. Okay, for this reason. Okay, maybe 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 I'm wrong, and some somewhere it is used, but. Uh, So, um, um, here is a scheme called DHIES uh, that uh, does it differently, and it's uh, specific uh, to uh, El Kamal, uh, more or less. Okay, it, it generalizes somewhat, but not. Not as much as Fujisaki Okamoto. Uh, so um, uh, let the ciphertext be like this uh, G to the R, and, um, and um, uh, authenticated uh, encryption. Um, under the key that is hash of uh, y to the r and uh, a message. Mm. But I think actually you probably have to add uh, g to the r to the hash. Uh, and again, sorry, I should have reviewed this, but I uh, possibly um, uh, I forgot. Uh, sorry, now it struck me that um, I um, that possibly um, you add um, um, uh, this uh, if you call it C one uh, to uh, authenticated. Uh, data in authenticated encryption. Okay, I, I forgot. Um, so, and um, uh, this is um, um, CCA secure. And uh, so what, so this authenticated encryption, if you remember, it's a, a CCA secure uh, symmetric key encryption, uh, but also it has to have uh, ciphertext integrity. So you cannot, uh, you know, given this ciphertext, you cannot create any new one that encrypts anything valid under this key. Um, and uh, so the claim is that the IHES is uh, CC secure uh, in random oracle model for H. So that part is the same as in uh, Fujisaki Okamoto. Uh, but you use a stronger assumption under uh, something called a gap uh, Diffie Hellman assumption. And um, the gap T. Hellman assumption is uh, like this. Adversary is given um, 
uh, gap uh, actually CDH assumption. Um, so the um, um, the adversary is given uh, uh, G, the generator of the group, uh, G to the A and G to the B, and he needs to compute G to the AB. So that's like uh, th this part is as in the computational DP Hellman. Uh, but a new thing is that he has an access to an oracle that solves the decisional DP Hellman problem and uh, gives him answers which are yes or no. The inputs to the decisional DP Hellman problem are of the following form. Um, they're like the generator, uh, G to the X, G to the Y, G to the Z. And um, the answer is yes, if Z is X times Y, uh, and the answer is no, uh, otherwise. In other words, let's say exactly like in a bilinear map, uh, elliptic curve with a bilinear map, you had access to the, the, the decision or the, the, the Fehman assumption because you could, using bilinear map, you could verify whether a uh, particular two, triple, tuple satisfies the dp Hellman relation or it does not. Bilinear map in particular, uh, you know, immediately gives you this verification. Even if you had access to such verification, then you still could not compute uh, the diffie hellman output. So this basically says, okay, if somebody could verify for you once you computed some uh, solution, then would it be easier for you to compute it? And um, uh, so to posit that Computational diffie Hellman is hard in elliptic curves with a bilinear map is to exactly posit this assumption. Um, and mm, it's as if somebody who solves a decisional problem, uh, you know, and just tells you yes, no, if you have the right answer, could help you figure out the answer. Well, if you create a, a list of possible answers, then clearly somebody who can test them and tell you which one is correct would help you. But not really, because if you just guess your uh, answer at random from a list, if the list was polynomial size, then a random guess, and it included the answer at some place, then a random guess is still non-negligible probability of outputting the answer. Um, it is it's not a proof that in general, this. Uh, such decisional oracle is not helpful. Uh, perhaps there are some intermediary stages in a searching space, which answering this would would help. But we don't know of examples of uh, groups in that this is the case. Um, it is a stronger assumption, uh, but we don't know examples which would say, okay, here is an elliptic curve. Do you have any attacks that solve this problem any better in this case? And we don't know. Um, um, why does it help in this case? Because uh, the, uh, to implement the decryption, you monitor hash queries. And so given the public key, which is G to the X, and a ciphertext, which is G to the R and something, some symmetric key encryption. You monitor hash queries and you use the Diffie-Hellman decisional Diffie oracle to tell you if any of the hash query inputs satisfy this relation uh, between the randomness G to the R and the key G to the X. If it does, then this hash is a Y to the R because this is G to the XR. So it's in the correct um, Diffie-Hellman relation. If, if uh, okay, so the oracle, the, the reduction here puts G to the X is, is the public, is the um, Elgama public key, G to the Y 
is this part of the ciphertext. And G to the Z is whatever was queried to the hash. So if adversary hashed the corresponding key, then uh, the reduction will be able to recover it and use it to decrypt. Okay. But the challenge one is going to, the challenge ciphertext will and uh, you know use a random value here. So, um, and solving the challenge would correspond to adversary hashing on the value given, uh, you know, that corresponds to the uh, uh, public challenge public key and a challenge cipher, this part of the cipher text. So uh, that would correspond to solving the dp Hellman problem. This would be the uh, NGML public key, and this would be the G to the R in the challenge cipher text. Okay, so I'm hand waving, but uh, that's the intuition for for security of this of this construction. Okay. Um, um, yes, and and this also takes care of the fact that the textbook El Gamal um, encrypts. Uh, you know, doesn't let you encrypt bit strings. It doesn't even bother looking at El Gamal as an encryption of something. It just takes this part of the ciphertext and directly hashes it. And using that part of the key. Uh, this looks like a, a textbook. So Katz Lindell um, um, call it hashed Dickie Hellman as hashed El Gamal, um, and it looks that, like this, an encryption under Y of M is G to the R hash of Y to the IR, uh, for example, uh, X or M. Okay, this is still, it's still malleable, right? Because you can take the ciphertext and XOR it with the delta, and it will create a valid encryption of M X or delta, but if you do this instead, uh, it it will break malleability, and in fact, you get uh, CCA security. Okay, so now um, uh, you know I went into um, problems of malleability and this gap between CPA secure and CCA secure encryption. Uh, let's look uh, how large the, uh, uh, these, uh, these fields have to be. Okay, so uh, that that will come from a, a generic attack um, uh, on a discrete logarithm and therefore also on the computational DP Hellman uh, and therefore uh, also on um, on you know El Gamal, right? Because in all these in the Fujisaki Komodo, we need CPA security of the en encryption scheme, and that was uh, for textbook El Gamal case based on decisional DP Hellman uh, uh, assumption. Uh, so uh, breaking computational DP Hellman breaks. Uh, decisional one, and uh, the same for 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 BHIES. Uh, you know we need uh, CDH to be strong, and if we break it, you know then of course this gap version is broken uh, as well, right? So um, so let's say that uh, G, which is um, uh, the group generated by some uh, by some generator, uh, which looks uh, like this, where i is in ZQ. So this is a multiplicative uh, group of order uh, Q, and uh, you know showed how to instantiate that, uh, either with elliptic curves or with uh, prime residue groups, and 
Uh, so what's the discrete log problem in this in this um, in group G? Um, adversary is um, he knows what the group is and what the um, order of the group is. So he knows the group, a generator, and the order of it. And the challenger picks a random um, a exponent, which is from the size of the group, and gives y uh, g to the x to the adversary. And the adversary is asked uh, to create x. And we say discrete uh, 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 the logarithm assumption uh, is that um, um, computing uh, x on uh, random y is infeasible uh, uh, except uh, for negligible probability. Right. So um, here is a generic attack that just depends on the size of the group. Um, it's a meet in the middle, um, uh, uh, meet in the middle type of attack. Um, if uh, x is in this uh, group, is of this size, right? Um, then uh, there exists x1 and x2 such that uh, x is equal to x1 plus square root of q times x2. And um, x1 and x2 are both in this range. Uh, right? Because uh, there is a square root of q possibility. And uh, the smallest one, 0, 0, gives you the smallest x. And the largest one will give you uh, basically q minus 1. OK, so uh, assume uh, that uh, square root is an integer. OK, and if it's not, then just take a floor, a ceiling sorry, of, of this, right? OK, how can I use this in an attack? Well, uh, A given Y uh, creates a table of values uh, x1 and uh, y1, which is g to the x1, uh, for all um, uh, 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 yeah, no, uh, let me change this. Um, g to the q, square root of q times uh, uh okay sorry. Yeah, okay x2 y2 uh like that uh and how many for all uh for all x2 in uh the range from zero uh to square root of q Okay. And um, okay, so maybe uh, note that this implies that y, which is g to the x, is equal to g to the x1 uh, plus square root of q x2, which is the same as g to the x1 times g to the square root of q. Uh, x2, which is the same as to say that y to g minus x1 is equal to g to square root of q um, x2. Um, okay, so he creates a table like this, and then uh, for all uh, x1 in uh, the same range, uh, test if y times g to 
x1 minus x1 uh, equals y2 for any uh, y2 in the table. Right? And um, if found uh, output x, uh, which is x1 plus quadrant of q, x2. Right, where well, x2 corresponds to this count y2. Um, so clearly, uh, because this equation holds, even only if uh, this one does, so if you found uh, this x1 y2 pair, and y2 you know the representation of it in this form, then this is correct. And how much work did you do? Um, the number of work, right? Like you independently created uh, square root of Q, um, this exponentiation. And uh, then you uh, run square root of Q testing, except that you also have to sort the table, right? So this is not exactly uh, square root of Q, you have to compute them and then so sort them, but that's a logarithmic factor because sorting is uh, is, is an added logarith logarithm of this factor. So therefore, this is uh, uh, like this, right? And, um, and this explains why if you want generic attack, to run with at least two to the AD steps, you need to square root of Q must be two to the AD, and therefore Q, uh, sorry, um, and therefore Q itself must be close to 200, two to the 160, right? Uh, square of that. Um, okay. Uh, there is uh, optimizations of this uh, of this attack. This one is called uh, baby step, uh, giant step, um, uh, because as a breaking of the discrete logarithm, I make so-called giant steps by computing uh, exponentiations that are consecutive, but with the square root of q as multiples of square root of q. So these are the giant steps, and these are the baby steps. I basically take consecutive multiple, uh, ma, um, products of g, right? Or, or g inverse, doesn't matter, yeah? So, um, so hence the name is also known as Shanks uh, algorithm. Um, and um, because in practice you would need to a huge this huge table, uh, so the storage would not be practical. Uh, there's also the space and time trade-offs. You can divide this. It's not hard to see. You basically take bigger giant steps to reduce the storage, and therefore you have to have more baby steps per each. Right? So this gives you uh, a storage um, space and time trade-off right there. Okay, and there's all sorts of uh, tricks you can play with it, but it does not change this basic, um, you know, the, the, so in, for implementation purposes, all of this matters, but it's not going beyond uh, this bound. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, <laughs> so now um, let me just uh, okay. So sorry, does it make sense uh, to introduce uh, signatures uh, within the limited time? Um, I think not very much. So. Um, Although, you know what, uh, 
well, why not, right? Let's introduce uh, what signatures look like, and then we'll instantiate them in an ergam in a, this if you have this free log setting using zero knowledge uh, proof next time. Uh, so, um, uh, so here is the, the syntax of a signature scheme and uh, and also the security notion. So a signature is uh, a signature scheme is made of three algorithms, key generate, sign, and verify, uh, such that the key generation generates a secret public keeper, just like a public key encryption. Um, the sign algorithm takes the a secret key and a message and outputs a signature. Uh, let's call it sigma. Okay, and uh, the verify algorithm takes the public key, uh, message and a signature and outputs uh, zero or one, um, reject, uh, accept, right? And um, correctness um, is that um, for every uh, secret key, public key in the, uh, generated by the key generation, and for every message in the message space, so here uh, M must be in M at the message space of the um, of the um, of the signature algorithm. Uh, but of course, um, you know the des desired uh, message space is uh, all bits, all bit strings, right? You, we might have an, as an intermediary step being able to sign restricted messages, like for example, group elements or uh, you know bit strings as long as the security parameter, and then hook up from that to signing arbitrary long messages. But that's our uh, goal. So for any message in a in a message space, um, if um, a signature is created. By, sign, by result of the signing operation, uh, then uh, uh, the verify um, under the corresponding public key with this message and this signature is guaranteed to output one. And you can um, say accept uh, for negligible uh, probability, uh, but in practice, uh, signature schemes almost never use this, uh, right? So the, the, they, they, you know, this is guaranteed with probability one. Okay, uh, what about security, obviously? Um, so there is uh, different notions of uh, uh, of, of uh, security cor uh, security for signature schemes, but the um, uh, max uh, notion uh, is uh, unfortunability is so-called existential uh, unfortunability uh, under uh, chosen message attack. Okay, and so that's called uh, uh, CMA. Okay, how does this look like? Adversary gets a public key. So a challenger first creates secret key public key pair. Adversary gets a public key and adversary gets an access to a chosen message attack oracle. Adversary can specify any message in the message space and the oracle use the signing algorithm using the secret key uh, to uh, create a signature on whatever it is the adversary asks for. So, uh, so this is C sigma i is equal to the signature um, under the secret key of mi. And he can recurse, right? He can, uh, okay, having uh, getting a signature on some first message, he can get a signature on second and so forth. He wins if he outputs pair uh, M star sigma star 
uh, such that first of all m star is not equal to mi for all i so uh, this message uh, the forgery is different from all the mi's that he got time for free and uh, secondly the signature verifies so the verify algorithm under this public key on uh, m star sigma star pair output one okay and we say that um uh, signature uh, scheme is uh cma secure um if for all efficient adversaries a uh, the probability uh, attack succeeds um is uh, negligible right the standard standard type. um note uh, if i didn't have uh, this public key if adversary doesn't have the public key uh, then this is a mac right because this is exactly security of a mac unforgeability of a mac attacker uh, sends chooses any num messages they are Macked because this is a symmetric key. Adversary has no information about it, and uh, uh, mm, the forgery has to verify under the same key. So if there was no public key, any Mac would give this to you because you would just generate a Mac key, set SK and PK to be the same key. You would generate Max here. And the forgery here would require adversary to forge under this unknown Mac key. The only difference, just like in the case of public key encryption, with you know, with um, compared to the symmetric encryption, is that you have to do the same, even though you have the public key, and therefore verification of signatures is a public operation. Anybody can sign, can verify. Uh, m sigma pairs right using this this algorithm um, uh, but we require the same level of security as for max if attacker having seen however many signatures on some other messages he cannot he can replay them just send mi sigma i pair but well that's a triviality he cannot get anything else signed on his own. Uh, there are weaker uh, notions of stack, like for example, uh, instead of asking that uh, treating a valid signature on any, however bizarre this message M star is, you know, perhaps the M star is like all zeros, or M star is made of some other strange strings, right? Like it looks random. Um, or you know whatever the case, uh, perhaps attacker gets an M star uh, chosen at random, and he doesn't have a choice of what M star he has to forge. He has to forge a target message, right? So that's a weaker notion. Uh, perhaps uh, it's possible to forge on some strange-looking strings. But given a random challenge string and ask to, to well sign that, perhaps no efficient algorithm can, right? But this is a stronger notion. Likewise, perhaps you don't have an or oracle access to a uh, signature that can sign anything for you. Perhaps you have an access to a signature oracle that signs random stuff. In other words, you just ask it, please sign something, and he generates MI at random. And he gives you an uh, mi sigma i pair. Okay, uh, such stuff is happening in some applications. This might be enough, uh, but this is the maximalistic notion, and it's generally usable. Uh, basically, the maximum of what we can do. Uh, so, so that's that's what any signature scheme in you know should standardized signature scheme should. Uh, that should be its goal. Okay. Um, let me know if you have 
uh, questions about about this or or anything else for that matter uh, and um, and see if um, and and next time we'll look at how to realize it under the discrete logarithm assumption. So uh, no questions to any of that, huh? Okay. Um, well, then then we'll continue on Wednesday with the uh, with the zero knowledge with the uh, with zero knowledge proofs and and uh, in particular applications to uh, creating these DL signatures. Okay. Um, I will post these these slides um, uh, with the video, and I will see you Wednesday.